Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to How Buyers and Suppliers Can Partner to Understand Their Mutual Customer, the End User. This is a one-hour webinar brought to you by the SIIA Content Division and the SLA. Hello, I'm Kathy Greenler Sexton, and I am the VP and General Manager of the SIIA's Content Division. And today's webinar is going to be presented by Robin Nydorf, the Director of Research for FreePoint, and Kelly McNamara, Buyer of Information Services for Keys Bank. We have a number of people on our line who represent the buy side and the sell side. And Robin and Kelly are going to be talking about both those sides to really benefit the end users today. So for today, I want to cover a few uh, housekeeping items. We're going to make a recording available after this event. And we will have copies available of the slides. Now, everybody on this webinar is in mute except for the presenters. Now, we do encourage chat. There's a question and answer chat window. So please ask questions as we go through the webinar. And at the end, we will answer your questions. Now, if for some reason we cannot get to everybody's questions, we will absolutely follow up afterwards. So please feel free to answer any, ask any questions. Now, as we go through the webinar, uh, Robin and Kelly are going to be talking about the benefits to buyers and sellers. We do have several polls, so get ready. We definitely want your, your uh, feedback. And as I mentioned, we will be uh, providing follow-up for those who need it. So as we get started, uh, I wanted just to spend a few minutes just talking about the SL, SIIA. We are the principal trade association for the software and information industry. And what we do, we promote the industry, protect, and educate member organizations to really help them meet their, their business objectives. And how we are organized, what we do is we, we basically are organized into five different uh, divisions. One is the content division, which I am, uh, I am the head of. We have a um, education division. We have a software services division. We have a finance division and a government uh, public sector services. And all these industries um, are, are supported by an anti-piracy and a public policy group. So when people join the SIIA, they really join all of the divisions uh, that they are a member of. The software, the, the content division itself, we have members that uh, create, publish, and deliver content across online, mobile, and digital platforms. They produce content-focused software applications and tools, and they develop enabling uh, technologies. And why do people join? They join basically for three reasons, business and corporate development, education on critical technology and market trends, which, as everybody knows on the call, is evolving very, very quickly. And, uh, and it's, it's important to stay up on top of all of that. And the third reason is public policy advocate and uh, intellectual property protection. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Janice Lachance, our partner in this webinar in the Buyer Supplier Series. And she runs the SLA. Janice? So I'm going to start talking. It uh, sounds like Janice has a, an issue with her microphone. So Janice, when you uh, get all set, uh, just, just jump right in. The SLA, the Special Libraries Association, is a professional home of e-resource and content specialists, library directors, competitive intelligence professionals, and legal librarians and more. It's a global organization that empowers its members through networking, advocacy, and professional de development. And there are three areas um, that they're focusing on uh, that uh, for professional, um, sorry, I'm, I'm reading our slides here. There's three areas that culminate at the premier event uh, f that's coming in July for the SLA uh, 2012 annual conference. And if you could just change to the next slide. Um, that's their annual conference which uh, will be held July 15th through 18th in Chicago. And we, are, we, the SLA and the SIIA, are going to continue the discussion from this webinar at the SLA 2012 Info Expo Exposition. And that will be July 15th at 2, 2 p.m. If you're interested, you can go to the SLA uh, website or the SIIA 
a website or just even uh, put something in your chat window and we'll provide you more information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin to uh, get started with the uh, webinar. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks to both the SIIA and the SLA for co-sponsoring the session. Um, really excited to be kicking off what's actually a series of different programming and events that we're providing, uh, Free Pint Research are providing, to help bring buyers and sellers together. We're working very closely with the SIA on this series. Um, the content division is um, sponsoring it as a, as a member benefit, but is also an industry benefit to enable uh, closer relationships between buyers and sellers of, of content products and services. FreePint is the organization that, that sits really between buyers and sellers overall. Um, we do a lot of research on the sell side of the industry because we're constantly doing product reviews and commenting on the industry overall. And our customers are on the buy side. So we have this insight into all the ways that um, buyers want to use content or are thinking about using content and what some of those internal issues might be. Uh, we really see our role as increasingly helping buyers and sellers talk to each other in ways that are uh, supporting the, the mutual benefit of both sides, reducing friction in the industry, and helping them do business together more effectively. One of the things that we've found over the last couple of years has been that both our buy side and our sell side customers have increasingly been saying to us something along the lines of, if only we could get into the heads of end users. And when we hear common questions and comments like that from both sides of that relationship, it tells us there's an opportunity here. If both buyers and sellers are asking a very similar question about a mutual customer, then isn't there a way that we can help those two sides understand each other's needs better so that they can leverage each other's efforts and really do that more effectively? And that really was the genesis between, uh, behind uh, supporting some of the content division's work at um, our flagship program in January in New York, the Information Industry Summit, bringing buyers and sellers together in that environment to have these conversations, this webinar, the roundtable that we'll be holding in the summer, and a host of other activities that we'll be conducting throughout the year. So we see this as an opportunity and having a unique position of being able to coalesce groups to talk about what those opportunities might look like, and to surface for everyone the fact that each part of this three-way relationship of buyer, seller, and user has a different perspective on what the needs might be, what kind of information is out there, and how we can all access it. But first I want to talk a little bit about what those perspectives might look like. The buyer, in this case, is somebody we tend to think of as being the corporate information professional. It's somebody who might be an information strategist. It might be somebody who sits in procurement. It might be a source expert within a corporate environment. Sometimes these people can be a little hard to identify, um, simply because the, the role of information manager, information strategist has changed so much in the last couple of years. There used to be in almost every organization of any size, something designated the library, the research center, the information center. But now a lot of the time we find that those people might sit within a knowledge center, they might sit with um, the IT team, it really depends on the configuration of the organization. And increasingly we're even finding that those people are embedded in different divisions of the company and don't necessarily sit as their own department. So that type of role still exists, but it might be dispersed throughout the organization in ways that are unexpected today. And that can be a challenge sometimes for the sell side to understand who those people might be and for those people to be able to raise their hand and say, yes, this is us, we're a group of people and we want to have a conversation about where the industry is heading. The seller can be both the traditional or the non-traditional media companies. Um, sometimes they're even an enabling technology company, one of the companies that sits between the content itself and the corporation and facilitates the delivery of that content into the corporation. So we use this term seller to mean anyone who facilitates or actually delivers content into the corporate environment. It could be a service provider, it could be a technology or software provider, and it could actually be the publisher themselves bringing that content directly into the organization. They've got a very unique perspective as well because they know what's happening in the publishing and the content delivery and the content dis dissemination side of the industry and they've got that perspective on what it is that they're trying to accomplish and how they want to work with their customer base. There's a really interesting trend that we've been tracking from both this buyer group and the seller group over the last couple of years to take a focus on the end user and that comes up from a number of different perspectives. 
in a lot of organizations, there's been an important trend in the last couple of years to push more and more information work directly to the end user, freeing up the information professionals to higher value work, to more strategic work, but really making much more information and a lot more products and tools directly accessible to end users, whoever they might be. If they're interacting with information, they might have access to more robust tools on their desktop than, or on their mobile devices than they ever have before. From the sell side, the trend has also been towards focusing on the end user. Increasingly, we're seeing buyers, we're seeing sellers who are producing products that are workflow enabled, which means they're really designed to deliver a set of content, not just to an organization, but to a particular type of user. So it might be the same content that they deliver to a number of different departments within an organization, but it's framed one way for the sales team. It's framed another way for the competitive intelligence team. It's framed a third way for the strategists. Uh, so this workflow enabled tool is something that really drives the vendor to go directly to the end user and say, we've come up with a solution that works directly for you. Um, so there's much more of a trend in that case for them to be going directly to end users within an organization, regardless of what their job function is based on what the deliverable might look like. So this three-way relationship is, is really quite complex, and each node of the triangle has its own perspective on what the needs are and what the big picture looks like, and increasingly, to understand the whole marketplace, you really have to understand the perspective and the data and the information that's available from all three nodes of this triangle. So to get us started with thinking about who's on the call today, we're going to do our first poll here. And this asks, who has better information about the needs of end users? We want you to select one of the options that's given here. Um, it gives you a chance to indicate if you're a buyer, primarily a buyer or primarily a seller, based on the definitions that I provided earlier, and whether you think buyers or sellers have better information and we'll have a chance then to share the results um, with everyone as soon as we have um, all the results in. You can select one of these. And just for some context, there are about uh, 25 people on the call, so it's not like we're doing a sample size research here, but it is a sort of a finger in the air, understanding the temperature of the room, where do you think more information is and who's got better information. So if you haven't yet voted, take another second and do so, please. All right, let's see what we've got here. Sharing the results, overall, both buyers and sellers think that buyers have better information about end users, which I think is a really interesting result. And it's something that actually when Kelly speaks about her experience on the buy side, I'd be curious as to her perspective on whether she thinks that that's accurate and how that might have an influence on reading her results and the way that she talks about gathering data from, 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 buyer, from the end users. Um, only 7% of the people on the call are buyers and think sellers have better data, and about twice as many are sellers and think sellers have better data. But really, the result here says that both buyers and sellers feel that buyers have better data about end users. Um, so it'll be very interesting um, as we go through, if you've got any questions about how you might apply your perspective on who has better data to some of the things that Kelly and I are presenting, um, that would be a really great um, something to enter into the questions, and we'll be sure to get to that during the Q&A. So with that in mind, I want to go on to um, taking a little bit deeper dive into understanding what it is that buyers know. What is the unique perspective that buyers have? And this speaks to those, um, that relatively large percentage of the people on the call who think that buyers have better data about end users. Buyers know about strategy. Buyers understand what the corporate strategy is. They understand what the whole portfolio of content that sits in front of the end users might look like. They know what sources and resources those people have in front of them. And they understand the business objectives. They know what buyers and their end users are really trying to accomplish when they have access to particular types of data. They know what the outcomes are that they're trying to get to. Um, they know what their budget targets are. They know how much they have to spend on different types of content and how that pie might get sliced up. They also have insight as to the internal information environment. They know what's on the internet, for example. They also know what other kind of know-how and know-what might exist within knowledge bases or proposals or other types of internally generated content. 
They also know what's competing for end users' attention within the corporate environment, and they also have access to the internal data. So they can see, for example, how users are accessing different products from an internal standpoint. They can see how users are interacting with the SharePoint or other collaborative work environment, and they can see what's happening within an intranet. On the other hand, sellers also have a unique set of data. Um, they have usage data. They can see what individual users are doing within their products, and they can often drill down right to the second and see what users are doing at any given moment, what their searches have been, and what kind of results they've pulled up. They know where their products are heading. They've got a strategic view on what's happening with information aggregation, information creation, and delivery. They understand the technology that sits between the content and the user, and they understand what their products are really good at. Um, so the perspective that they have is really what was the intention here, where is it heading, and how can we help our buyers get the best possible value from the investment that they might be making with us. Sellers also have a wealth of knowledge about best use cases. Um, if you've worked with a lot of different customers on your project, product, you understand who's got the best results out of it and how they got there. You can take that knowledge about best usage to other customers and be able to apply that knowledge to them to help them get the same type of res result. They really understand how their customer industries or their user bases might be performing overall. They can do different types of user benchmarking, comparing one customer to another, comparing one customer to a full data set, to really have an understanding of what works well for different customers, different types of users when they go after their product. So that's a, a unique type of information that sellers have. With that as preamble, I'm going to turn it over now to Kelly, who's going to share a case study on a high-touch approach to understanding end users and partnering better with vendors to help them understand her users and move the industry forward. Kelly? Thanks, Robin. Um, I, I do think that the poll results are a little interesting. I, of course, am on the buy side, and I think depending on what kind of information you're talking about, and you just did a really great job sort of delineating the, the two the, the different con the different types of information buyers and sellers have, um, I, I think that um, it's interesting because I think we both, buyers and sellers, want what the other person has, I think was, is really the situation. Um, for the audience, I'll just spend a few moments um, creating some context for this case study that I'm going to tell you about. KeyBank is uh, one of the largest banks in the U.S. We have about 15,000 employees in 14 states. Um, and we do consumer banking all the way up to large corporate investment banking. Um, I work on the corporate side of the house, so that includes investment banking, real estate capital, um, equipment leasing, as well as several product groups for the corporate market. Um, from 2003 until 2009, uh, Key had a full service research and analysis uh, service or a corporate library, which I managed. We had uh, six full-time librarians on staff. We handled about 200 to 250 requests a month from that corporate bank audience. Um, when the research service was closed, we really just said to our users, you've got to learn to fish for yourselves. Um, our end users now have some of the tools on their desktop that we used to use in the library, but there's really no way for them to get any research assistance. Um, my role evolved into that of manager of information services. Um, and I'm now responsible for understanding our users' information-seeking behavior, their needs, identifying the products that meet those needs, um, working with both vendors and our internal procurement strategists to get favorable terms and contracts in place, uh, rollout, deployment, user administration, training, ongoing evaluation of the tools. So I'm one of those kind of maybe new roles. Um, that Robin referenced in the beginning of her remarks that we didn't really have previously at Key, but we do now. Um, when Key did have a corporate library, um, most of our vendors dealt directly with us in the library, myself as the manager, and except for a very small suite of desktop tools, we didn't really have end users per se. The librarians were the users of the tools, so the decisions about what we needed were made based on our needs that we needed to serve our internal clients. Um, once we moved to that self-serve model, it was like open season around here. We have maybe 60 products in our portfolio, and all of those vendors wanted access to the end users for sales, demos, and training. 
I, I know the product expert can tell a story of the tool best, but the direct contact really started to create a lot of confusion in our environment. Our users didn't know if they were allowed to talk to vendors, if they did, if they were allowed to purchase tools, or if they were allowed to enter into contracts of their own. And furthermore, they aren't trained to evaluate tools. I mean, everything on the buffet looks great to an end user, right? Um, so they don't have the experience to evaluate the tool the way an information professional would. They don't have a lens into what the larger enterprise is doing overall in terms of purchasing from vendors. And they don't have the expertise or really the authority to enter into any contracts on their own or negotiate contracts. Um, but I also realize that vendors have a lot of data and information that I need. So usage data is one of those things, as Robin mentioned. Um, but also some of the things she mentioned, like best practice information, um, insight into what other companies in our space are doing. Um, you know, I'm a member of SLA and I'm a member of the Business and Finance Division, but I, you know, don't really have a lot of day-to-day -day relationships with people who act as my peers where I really have a lot of insight into what people at other organizations are doing, but vendors do. Um, so we were sort of at this impasse, you know, how do I give vendors access to their customers, the end users, while still maintaining the productivity of the end users in our environment and not having them, you know, constantly taking phone calls, attending disparate meetings with vendors. So I started to think about what vendors always want to do when they come to visit. And I noticed that they always talked about training, um, which I suspected was really a way to demo new products as opposed to actually training. Um, I also knew from conversations with my users and looking at the usage data that we did have that we really did have um, an expertise deficit um, with the tools, um, which makes sense since most people had never used them before they were forced to when the library closed. So I was really kind of not surprised about the fact that our, we didn't have a lot of expert users on staff. So the aha moment to me was that if we could create a forum for actually actually training users how to use the products, I could also give vendors access to those users that didn't require all of this individual contact with them. So we developed a training program we called Boot Camp, highly original. Um, it consists of three separate weeks per year where we ask all of our vendors to lead training sessions for their products. Um, we have several sessions for each product throughout the week so that people can fit them into their schedule. And we offer them both in person and via webinar, sort of as a nod to our productivity as well as our disparate geography. I mentioned we're in 14 states. So originally, we tried to sort of force our, our Cleveland users, Cleveland is where we're headquartered, to attend in person. Um, but we finally caved into the reality that people, you know, they just couldn't make it up the three floors to our conference center. So we, we have a lot more webinars now than we did the first time. And when I approached the vendors the first time, my pitch to them really was, you know, I will ensure access to our end users. Um, but it has to be in a way that fits our model. And in exchange for playing by our rules, I'll give you meaningful access to those users and to information about them. So I feel like we really do provide a service to the vendors. We handle all the logistics, um, all of the scheduling, all of the inviting, all the communication. Really all the vendors have to do is um, show up. I do have a couple screenshots here in the presentation um, for what uh, some of the things um, for our boot camp, one of them that you see here is the database we developed around scheduling. So you can see um, that we do have, this is for our, our most recent boot camp, that we do have um, a lot of sessions that we offer and a lot of multiple sessions and that a lot of them are online as well. And then the um, other slide here is what the database would look like for a user when they would go in. And we do take um, pains really to construct that description that you see um, hand in hand with the vendor, um, which gives, you know, another little um, it's, a, it's another little window for the vendor to touch users with their message about their product because what we're saying there about their product is really driven by um, the vendor. The vendors, um, myself and my staff, we all have the same goal, to get end users to use the tools we provide and leverage as much of the features and the functionality as possible. Um, however, it seems that depending on the vendor, we have distinctly different ways of getting there. And I will give you the example, I won't name the vendor, but um, despite several conversations with them where we said we really need you to work through our team in order to communicate with our users, I was told that, well, our, our people, our sales staff, um, it's part of their performance review 
and that they document that they have individually spoken to all of the users that you have at your company. And you know, as much as I felt bad for that person, I, I really couldn't let you know the way that this company did their performance reviews impact how one company out of 50 or 60 was going to get to interact with my users. Um, some other challenges that we face we, as we consider how to best manage boot camp and you know, our vendor relationships overall, um, educating vendors on how we do business here. So as I just mentioned, um, you know, sometimes getting our message across that we would really like you to work through us, we will provide you all the data that you need, we will make it a streamlined experience for you. Um, asking them to do schedule any or vet any communications with end users through our team. Um, you know, one thing, we, we had a user call up and he wanted access to a certain tool and when we told him what the charge back to his cost center would be, he decided it really wasn't, didn't have that much value to him. However, he went to an industry conference in his industry and this vendor happened to have a booth there and, you know, they said, oh, we'll sign you up and we'll sign you up for our newsletter and, you know, the person kind of then thought that maybe they were getting it for free by not working through our team and when they came back to the office and realized that, no, we, we still have to charge you back for your seat. So, you know, it's just a little, it takes a little bit of work to get vendors on the same page with, with us in terms of how we communicate with users. Um, the other thing that we have been working on is educating vendors on how to participate in our boot camp to really let them know it's not a sales opportunity. It truly is a lear learning opportunity for users. Now, that being said, by introducing them to features and functionality that they already have access to that they don't know about, I mean, that's what we're encouraging. What we don't want to do is be demoing products that we don't have yet, um, trying to upsell or sell ancillary services because we do have a strategy that is at sort of the level of the information services team and our larger support team for the corporate bank for purchasing content and each individual user you know isn't in charge of making those decisions nor are they capable of it as I mentioned previously. Um, and one thing we do need from our vendors is to really help us massage our boot camp curriculum. You know, we started out the very first one and we kind of did 101s on all of the tools and then realized like, okay, now most people have done the 101, we need more content. So, you know, we, we, we're asking our vendors to maybe teach more challenging aspects of the tools, to focus on small um, targeted groups of users who all do the same thing, that are all in the same role, that might use the tool in a specific way. Um, so we really are leaning on our vendors to kind of maybe break out of their box of their standard training that they would do and develop training that is more professional development for our users. So um, that's been our experience. As Robin said, it's a very um, high touch um, endeavor both between us and our vendors and us and our users. Um, and I certainly welcome any questions or comments that you might have about our specific situation, but also, you know, just welcome the opportunity to speak with any of you, um, even at um, SLA this year. And I will be at the, um, the joint event with SLA and SIIA, so introduce yourself. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, really interesting to, to hear how you've come about with this particular model. And when we first had the conversation about it, it, it seems so obvious to try this as a model, and yet you and I have talked about we don't know of many other corporate environments that have put this much time and effort and planning into really providing this kind of week-long experience of professional development where you specifically invite all vendors to participate. Um, I'd be very curious to know um, if there are other companies that have done similar types of things or, or parallel types of things, but I think it's a great model to think about, and it's especially something as more and more corporations are pushing so much information work to the end users that a strategic level thinking around, okay, how do we make sure that they're getting the most value out of the, the resources we're investing in is a great thing to, um, for corporate environments to be investing in and also to be partnering with their vendor base in order to be able to make that as successful as possible. Yeah, so I, I want to now talk, that, you know, yep, go ahead. Oh, I will say that I had asked most of our vendors who participate with us if they are participating in or have seen things like this at their other clients and at least the vendors vendors that we work for and the clients they work with, we haven't really seen anything. So Right, right. Um, and I did have just one question quickly to go in. How many employees um, could you potentially have go to boot camp overall? Oh, right. So we have about 2,100 people that have access to at least some some tools. So that would be a minimum of like two tools. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty big audience, and we certainly haven't touched everybody yet. So Okay. 
Okay, and, and you also, I don't think you mentioned this time, it's, it's conducted three times a year. Yes, three times a year, for one okay. week, three times a year. Great. So now I want to take a look at the other end of the spectrum where, you know, this is, Kelly presented a high-touch approach, and now let's look at a high-tech approach. I mean, all of us have a lot of data that we can pull out of systems and understand more about um, the, the digital pathway that different people are taking through products through an intranet, uh, through different kinds of services and understand what users are doing without them needing to report because um, users don't always report exactly what they want or need and this is another way that we can um, use the existing data, leverage that existing data a little bit better. Uh, for this case study I'm, I'm relying on um, a detailed interview I did with a FreePint customer and in this case uh, this is a corporate environment, a large multinational enterprise was really trying to get a better understanding of how a range of vendors that were being used in a number of different geographic locations were um, actually being leveraged and utilized by the end users. So they constructed a system that was going to pull together a lot of detailed analytics, both from their own internal user uh, resources. So they were tracking a lot of um, behind the firewall behavior with uh, what was happening on different logins, what the pathway for those logins was through different types of resources. And then they were also bringing into the mix the usage data from 12 different vendors. And the really important investment piece for this customer was that they had to normalize the data from these 12 vendors. And these were all vendors that were doing an excellent job of providing data on usage. But they each defined usage slightly differently based on what the product was and what they were expecting to look at in terms of what the user wanted to do. So the customer in this case, the, the information center and strategist in this case, had to really work with each of those vendors to adapt some of that data to make sure that it was really an apples to apples comparison. And that actually took a great deal of time, and we're only talking about a dozen vendors here. So in order to be able to do something comprehensive across, say, the portfolio of 60 that Kelly was referring to, is, it could be a really intense investment. And just to keep that in mind, um, that not all usage data is created the same or is created equal. Um, but they really wanted to define, this is what we mean by the usage we want to track, and then these were the types of, of customers that we wanted to take a close look at. Once they went through that pain of creating the database and normalizing all the data so that it was, it was comparable, they were then able to start fairly quickly assembling summaries on a monthly basis by department, by job title, and by different project codes. So it was that initial investment that took a great deal of time, took about three months just to get to that point. But once it was in place, it was, it was spitting out meaningful data very, very regularly, and they were very quickly able to identify a number of trends that they wanted to take a closer look at. So it's a couple examples out of their results. Um, this one here shows the, um, what they defined access in this case as being a user viewing a headline and an abstract. That for them was meaningful access because they knew what the end user was trying to do with that information. Um, some of their vendors were, had a default usage statistic that they only tracked downloads, so they actually had to then work with those vendors to figure out how they were going to pull that data that, that really looked just at this headline and abstract. Um, sometimes vendors tracked separately headline view versus abstract view, so they had to compress that data together to make sure that they were getting a, a, a good view on what was happening. But eventually they were able to get all 12 of these vendors really looking at the, providing that data in similar ways. And then they were able to also compare the information that they got from the vendors to their internal record. So if vendor one, vendor two, and vendor three each were reporting different types of headline abstract access, they could then compare that total to what the internal record was reporting as headline and abstract. So you can see here from these stacked bars compared with the line that in each of these departments that they were looking at, the numbers didn't quite add up. So there would be a little bit of a discrepancy between if you add together vendors one, two, and three and what that total looked like compared to what the internal data set. So the result for that is that it gave them places to look for potential duplication of coverage. And that wasn't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. They just wanted to know where, is, where are the places within our content set that we may be duplicating some coverage. And it was able to give them an insight into both what their users really, really needed to get their work done, as well as where they might be able to condense or consolidate or train people slightly differently in order to get the results they wanted. 
So for these different departments, we have a competitive intelligence department, a kind of standard business information services, business development, and then strategy. So this is one view of that data. This is a one-month period um, of looking at that data. Then we flip the data on the side to now take a look at the overall spread of access, both in the internal record as well as for each of these three different vendors. And what we're able to see here is that there's one discrepancy in the access pattern. Um, the internal record, vendor one and vendor two, all have relatively similar access patterns when you look at these different departments that might be accessing data. Whereas for vendor three, there's a different usage pattern. And again, this isn't necessarily to say it's good or bad, but it's something to be investigated. It's something to get a better sense of, okay, is there something unique about that data set that we might want to think differently about? Is there something that we can talk to one or more of the vendors about in terms of awareness of tools or awareness of different types of access? Or is it simply that that particular vendor is more um, appropriate and applicable for one department over, other, over others? So being able to interrogate the data this way has given them a way to start really building different types of relationships with their vendors and thinking extremely strategically in order to really understand how can we partner with each of these vendors to get the maximum value on both sides. So it's only when they were able to compare vendors' data to one another as well as to the internal record that they're able to get this kind of insight. And that's certainly a, a significant investment for an organization to make, but given the amount of investment overall that the organization is making in content and in making sure that end users have access to excellent content, it was definitely worth it. And it's created a number of new types of partnerships with their vendors where they're really able to say, okay, this is what we're seeing, for example, our competitive intelligence department wanting and needing. How is that lining up with what you're planning to do with your product? Um, so it's given them a way of, of being a strategic partner in business development, product development, as well as um, really understanding their user base much more carefully. It's also helped them think differently about what types of training they might want to bring forward. And I've actually already had a conversation with them about the, the model that Kelly's presented of a boot camp. It's like, okay, now that you understand this kind of data, you can be really, really specific with a vendor on what you want them to focus on in training based on the data that you're able to see compared with the other data. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting way of starting to be able to look at the information. And it's only possible when the information professionals are freed up from the day-to-day -day research work and are able to take a much more strategic look at the portfolio, at usage, and what those needs might be. I also wanted to share this um, figure from um, my uh, friends and partners at theft.com. Um, we do a lot of partnering with the FT.com, and I'm always particularly impressed and amazed when I take a look at the different types of data that they're able to pull out um, from their system. They, they obviously, they grab a great deal of data over, uh, over time from different sources, and this is an example of uh, how they track usage levels based on the type of access that a user is, is using, so whether it's a desktop, a tablet, or a smartphone, as well as the time of day. And I'm not going to talk extensively about this other than to say you can, you can see what we all kind of expect, which is different peaks and valleys of usage based on the medium of access, where the desktop is much more of a work day kind of access, and the mobile devices are much more of a breakfast, morning commute, and evening event. Um, but they're now using this data to start thinking differently about what content they publish when and who they might be pushing that content out to um, in what format and what form. Um, and what I really love to think about when I look at something like this is as a corporate information professional, as somebody who sits like in Kelly's chair or in the by chair, think of how powerful this type of information would be if you could have it around your user base, if you were able to track over time how your users are accessing your intranet or accessing different databases, whether it's desktop, tablet, smartphone, time of day, et cetera, and how much of an impact that might have on your ability to make content discoverable and to make sure that they truly were accessing the content that was most relevant to them depending on what they were doing in that moment of the workflow. So I want to talk very briefly about, with all of this said, how does the buyer benefit? I mean, none of this is easy to do. All of it takes time, takes resources, it needs creating the business case for it. Um, but a couple of things that we've already heard about and I think are really clear is that it enables buyers to make much smarter purchases based on their actual needs. 
And I, I do think that buyers have that insight even without the partnership with the vendors, but I think that by partnering with vendors to really understand the end user better, it's that much more able to truly say this is what the needs are and, and how we can maximize whatever budget we have and how we want to deploy our resources. It's also possible, as Kelly spoke about, to be much more targeted in training and development. And that's also something that I've seen now in the customer case study that I presented, is that the more data you have about what is actually happening in the product and at the desktop, the easier it is for you to determine how can we help our users be as effective as possible when they're interacting with those, those resources. And finally, um, and this may not be as, as important within the corporate agenda, but I certainly think it's important to think about from an information industry standpoint, is that partnering and putting the investment into the partnership gives buyers an opportunity to influence product development. Uh, there is no group that better understands what users are going to want to do with content in 12 months, in 24 months, than information professionals, than content buyers who sit within those organizations and really understand the business needs. So the closer you can get with vendors and the closer you can work with them on saying, this is what we want your product to be able to do 12 months from now, because here's where our business need is heading, the more effective those product development projects are going to be and the easier it's going to be for both sides of the industry to move that forward. From the seller perspective, there's a number of benefits that, that you also get out of investing in this kind of partnership and really making the time and human resources and data available. Um, you do have the opportunity to get more insight directly from those buyers, um, whether that's access to the direct access to the users through training, direct access to the users through different types of communication, or even just internal data um, that buyers might be willing to share with you in order to, to move this partnership forward. There is also a sales opportunity to be more specialized in the types of products you're offering to different parts of an organization and to really go at the business problem and put your product to work on the business problem in ways that make much more sense from the buyer perspective and thus make them more likely to, to select that product. And then there's also that, that benefit of really having input from intelligent buyer partners and also from users on where the product might head. There are so many different choices that, that publishers have and that they can make around what's the next generation of our product need to look like? Do I need to be more heavily invested in mobile? Do I need to find a technology partner that can integrate me with different types of things? The people who have the answers to those questions are your buyer partners. And the more we can bring those two sides together to have those conversations, the more effective the next generation of products is going to be. So anything that you'd like to add on that, Kelly, um, in terms of where you see buyer and seller benefits? I'd like to take myself off mute. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, I think it has to do with um, product development, but I also think it has to do with just current, you know, products the way that they are usage. Um, what I see a lot of, and it would be great if I could find out more from my vendors, is a very um, superficial usage of the tools that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I just feel like for the investment that we make in a lot of those tools, to not have people sort of really, so for example, a lot of different tools might market themselves as like a complete workflow solution. Mm -hmm. And the vendor would, you know, hope that the user would kind of go in there in the morning and stay within that tool, you know, all day long. Um, but we don't find, at least anecdotally from our users, that's how they're using it. So I think if we can understand just a little bit more about users and how they use tools, you know, forget about developing new facets of a product. Let's just see how we can get people to be more sticky to products that we already have and that are already in our portfolio. All right, great. So I want to take a minute to do another poll, and then we'll go into some conclusions and an opportunity to respond to a few of the questions that have come through and ask a few others as well. So one of the things that um, I've talked with a number of people about as I've looked at partnership between buyers and sellers is that there certainly are barriers. Um, it does take effort, and it does take time and resource that, that many organizations are having a hard time coming up with. So let's just think together for a minute about what are the biggest barriers you think you face around your ability to get better information from and about your end users? And this is regardless of whether you're on the buy side, the sell side. What, what's difficult here? Um, and I want you to select the, the thing that you find the most Bar the, the biggest barrier that faces you. So which of these is your, your biggest barrier?
And if you've selected other, um, please put what you have as other in the questions pane so we can see what those are, please. Tough to choose one, I know. So if you haven't yet selected, please do. All right, let's see what we have. So nearly half the people um, report that this is just not an organizational priority, and that's a, that's a big barrier. Um, certainly, you have to make the business case for it. Um, like I said, everyone's got limited resources today, and in order to be able to put resources into a project like partnering with vendors, you have to be able to make the business case. So I think going back to some of the things about how buyers and sellers can benefit and really fleshing those out based on what your particular business outcomes could be one way of doing it. Um, so that's, that's certainly a, a key thing to, to keep in mind. Um, the inconsistency of, a, of the data is a, is a key barrier too, and I think that that highlights again the difficulty that, that my customer had in being able to normalize data from just a handful of, um, of those uh, resources to be able to compare apples to apples. Um, and even internally, sometimes it's hard to compare data if you're pulling information from a lot of different systems. There's also simply the lack of data. Um, and a couple people did um, select other, and I see that one person's note here is that uh, the lack of best practices to retrieve the information from the end users. I mean, there's certainly a sense that we are kind of inventing the wheel here, um, really trying to get a better understanding of what might the options be for extracting that information, and then being able to, um, to use it in a meaningful way. So the more we have these conversations with each other about how do you get information from end users, the more we can start to build a picture of what best practices might look like and, um, and what that could be. So a couple concluding comments. Um, I like to find common ground as much as possible um, between the different elements of any business relationship. And really, I think that there's a lot of ways that the buy side and the sell side of the information industry today have really shared concerns about end users. And I think one place to start understanding how you can partner is to ask yourself, with the, whichever part of that relationship you're, you're in, is what's the role of an end user in driving your business? So from the sell side, certainly the role of the end user is going to be around, they're the ones using my product. So the more end users I have and the happier I can make them, the, the healthier my business is going to be. From the buy side, the role of the end user is they're doing the work. So again, keeping them happy, getting them productive, getting them getting the most value out of the resources they're getting is going to drive that, that outcome. But at the nub of it on both sides is, is the centrality of that end user in driving the business forward. So finding the way that you can both talk together about end users and, and what their needs are and how you can partner is a way of thinking about how alike you are. I, the, a couple of the things that I've heard very commonly from both buyers and sellers is that end users sometimes have a gap between what they do versus what they say. If you ask people what they want, they'll tell you one thing, but if you actually track the data, you'll see something else. So that's a shared need that both buyers and sellers have about understanding end users. Both buyers and sellers are very aware that there needs to be more training and awareness among end users of what products to use when, what resources to use when, how to get the most value from any of those resources. That's definitely an area where there's a lot of alike understanding of how do you move forward. And certainly, everyone only has a piece of the picture. If you think again about the triangle that we presented early on, a buyer, seller, user, each one only has one piece of the picture and only one way of thinking about um, what's happening. So all of these are opportunities for finding common ground and a way of thinking about how can we partner together in order to get mutual value and contribute to the success of all of our business. So with that said, I'm going to pass this back to Kathy. Um, she's got a couple questions um, to look at. And um, Kathy, uh, why don't you let us know what you've got? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Kelly. Uh, what a great conversation. Um, and I, I really do encourage people, if you have any questions, to, uh, to submit them via the chat window. Um, I do have one, actually, already. 
so it, it's, here's a question. Can you please describe the deliverables back to the sellers to support the better exchange of information? Uh, who'd like to take that one? Uh, that's a Kelly question, I believe. Yeah, um, so what we have been able to share um, with our vendors is, um, as a direct result of our boot camp, for example, is um, who the attendees were. Um, but we also try to layer in some data to help them understand. So our, um, we keep a, a database of our users in access, and so we're able to set up some pretty sophisticated analysis. So we show our vendors not only who the attendees were, um, but also what groups they come from, what major lines of business, and then more targeted lines of business here, so they can start to get a sense of, you know, in the banking industry, maybe portfolio managers are more interested in this tool, whereas, you know, equity salespeople are more interested in this part of the tool, whereas investment bankers are interest, more interested in this part of the tool. So we try to give them a little bit more information um, than just the name of the person. Um, as far as an actual deliverable, you know, we just do reports, um, you know, after the boot camp is over where we recap all the attendees at all of the sessions so that um, they know what the attendance was like. Great. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Um, please feel free to submit your questions. Um, there are a couple coming in. Um, I just want to quickly remind everybody that at the Special Libraries Association Annual Conference, SLA 2012 in Chicago, we're going to continue this, discuss this discussion uh, in a roundtable format. So if you are interested in uh, coming to that, uh, please go to either one of the URLs on your screen. Uh, let me uh, ask another question here. Um, I believe, Kelly, this is for you. How has actual training and outcome changed based on the boot camp? Um, so w one thing that we've been able to do is um, we have been able to train more people than we would have when we were doing it in an ad hoc way. Typically what would happen here is a vendor would call me you know, a week before they were due to be in town and say, we're going to be there next Wednesday and we want to, you know, have a session with a group of your users and we'll bring them lunch. And so I would, you know, set up a room and set up the technology and get the invite out and maybe 15 people would say that they were coming and at the end of the day when it actually happened, maybe two would show up. So it wasn't a good outcome for us. It wasn't a good outcome for the vendors. Um, so I think just being able to give people a way to plan, both the vendors and the users, um, when these boot camps are. We tell our vendors at the beginning of the year when all the, diff the three different weeks throughout the year. So I think they can plan better um, their approach and their interactions with Key, and our users can plan better as well. So I think that that's um, a great outcome. Um, another thing that's happened is we have had some people, um, sometimes business leaders or team leaders, will attend like a one-on-one -on -one session because they don't really know if a particular tool is going to be right for everybody on their team. And what will come out of that is an ability for us to set up outside of boot camp um, uh, a session for just a particular team of users. So, you know, maybe uh, a team of uh, salespeople in our treasury services or something like that where mm -hmm. their team leader came to the training that was part of boot camp, decided this tool was really important for his or her team, and then asked us to facilitate setting something up with users. So um, I, I can't say necessarily that we've seen a sustained um, overall increase in usage of the tools, but as we track it, we definitely see spikes in usage of the tools after the boot camps, which you know I think is pretty understandable. So I think maybe that's the next thing we need to think about is how to sustain between sessions um, the usage of the tools. That, that's, that's really interesting, Kelly. Um, here's another question. Um, I, I'm going to improvise here, so if I didn't ask it in the right way, just re-ask the question, please. It's about getting the user data uh, from uh, the service providers. And since we have buy side and sell side on the call, I'm going to ask both you and Robin to kind of represent each of those hats about uh, uh, getting the user data effectively uh, between the buyers and the sellers, the challenges and, and those sorts of things, or tips for the people on the call. Um, Robin, I, I can start from the, the buyer side. Um, uh, is Robin mentioned, and I can't wait to hear what she has to say earlier about that, the idea of normalizing the data. So every vendor is giving us a different 
statistics. Some people give us last login. Some people give us how many logins. Some people can give us incredibly detailed information. Everybody's got something different. Um, so what we've tried to do with our vendors is when we enter into a relationship at contract negotiation time, account review time, you know, whatever, when we're having sort of more strategic meetings with our vendors, is talk about here is the kind of information that we would like to know about our users and can you provide it. And what we found out is they probably collect a lot more information than they deliver to us. So I think you just have to ask. You have to know what it is you want to know and ask if it's available. Um, for example, one thing that we never was never proactively delivered to us was information about um, our users who were contacting our vendors' help desks. And we decided it would be really good information for us to have. Who's calling you? What's the subject of their question to help us identify training needs? And of course, they're collecting that on their side. We just never thought to ask for it. And when we did ask for it, they said, yeah, you know, no problem. We can get that for you. Um, and I think especially if you have large relationships, I think that that's just something you should expect out of that relationship with a vendor when you are um, a, a very important, very relevant client for them, that they would be willing to work with you um, on what kind of data they provide you about your users. The other thing that I would add to that is that I would actually look at some of the software providers as being potential um, additional partners in the process. Um, there's a lot of um, companies and, and a number of them are members of, of the content division that specialize in facilitating the delivery of content and they really get how do you pull content in and push content out in a way that's useful and I think that they could be a really key piece in starting to figure out um, that flow of content through the enterprise and getting meaningful information to both the original publisher as well as to the corporate um, information strategy corporate library equivalent in that organization. So that, that's another place that I think there's, a, there's untapped opportunity to, to partner. Great, great suggestions both uh, Robin and Kelly. Uh, we're running out of time. Robin, can you quickly just walk through for the people uh, here on the webinar what to expect if they attend the uh, Buyer Supplier Roundtable at SLA? Yeah, and I'm really excited about this program. I, I, one of the opportunities that we have in a face-to-face -face environment is to have a different type of conversation, really much more of a multi-way conversation than we can really facilitate easily in a webinar. And I want to use that opportunity to have some of that future-focused conversation about where is content delivery heading, what's our industry doing, and bringing the perspective of the information strategists, the buyers, to the room, and bringing the perspective of the people who are building products into the room, and look together at how are we envisioning information work to look 24 months out or three years out. Um, because I think that we, we're going to create a picture together of something that neither side would necessarily create on its own, but I think it's going to be very important for both sides to really be bringing back to their organizations and thinking differently about what it is we're trying to create. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, well, we are at the top of the hour. I would like to thank Janice Lachance and the team at the SLA uh, for their partnership in the Buyer Supplier Series on this webinar and at SLA. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you for everybody for spending an hour of valuable time from your day to, uh, to listen to us and to share your thoughts and questions. Great. So thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thanks very much.